damn stone I was born in a small town and probably would have died there, ending my life in the prime of life from drinking, like many locals, if it were not for my childhood friend Cat, that is, Caustic. At the age of 13 with my parents, he first visited a major city and fell ill with it. While the kids dreamed of mysterious islands and treasures, he raved about a noisy anthill, which is everything that, in his opinion, is necessary for happiness. After school he persuaded me to try another life, and we left for the capital. At first it was tough, dorms, part-time jobs, studying, and then it was off to a good start the first good earnings, the two of us setting up a business. I got married soon, but Cat still couldn't get married. The girls followed him around in droves, but the night that he successfully portrayed was accompanied by a heavy character, jealousy, and the principle if you love a queen, then a queen. Queen. He kept joking that if he married, it was only to share in stone. In general, life got better. I even moved my relatives closer to me. But Costia didn't make it. The old folks died, went off to bury them, and disappeared. Cot came back three months later, all drained and tired. He offered to buy out his share in the business. He wanted to go home. I was amazed. He could call Moscow home, but not the backwater from which we had once miraculously escaped. He called it USD Zazapinsky with undisguised hatred in his voice and insisted that it was his parents who were coming to visit him, if only not to show up there himself. And who in his right mind would go from the capital to the miserable town where the only outdated factory was built in the times of the Tsar Garok, but which was about to be closed? He says I don't get enough sleep in Moscow, but there's fresh air. I've slept enough for all these years, and he has such bags under his eyes. I tried to talk sense into him, at least to persuade him not to sell the flat or move out. But I failed. He did not listen to reason. He threatened me, hissed that I did not interfere in his life. I fought and fought with his sudden delirium, and gave up. To hell with it, he wanted to ruin his life. I bought his share, and we had a terrible fight at the end. And three months later he calls me, as if nothing has happened, invites me to the wedding. I, of course, said yes. Finally there was a logical explanation for the departure. Only that such a rational, cold-blooded and intelligent man so lost his head because of a woman? I do not know. Even if he really did dig himself a Sharon Stone in the outback, and how damn right the dug-up turned out to be. Pale, not ugly, but gray and inconspicuous, with liquid hair and a ponytail, overweight, short, Scared of everyone, speaks softly and mostly nonsense, even less intelligence than beauty. Almost Sharon Stone, yeah. And next to Cat Tall, charming, handsome in person, athletic build, always stylishly dressed, well read and into history and archaeology. I was shocked, although I had one thought. Was it a knockoff? I approached him at the wedding, as he was smoking on the back porch of the shabby restaurant. No, you wouldn't believe it. Cat looked up at me with a weary and extinguished look. I just can't do it without her. I know it sounds awful. I'm uncomfortable without her, almost to the point of physical pain. I guess it's not love. I don't know what it is, but sometimes you just have to not resist fate. The answer was more than strange, but I couldn't get anything more out of him. 
During the days I stayed with them, he talked about everything but his wife. He shared his plans to renovate his parents' house, invited me to come over in the summer. And yes, now we were calling back. He was obviously happy to ask me about my news, interested in the affairs of the firm. But he answered categorically no to suggestions to return at least for a while. More and more often he called me to rest, and at the end of June he persuaded me to go. Things were getting worse and worse since his departure. The dusty Moscow was pressing me with its red-hot asphalt. It seemed such a good idea to go to the countryside, especially since his wife had gone to her parents to the sea with the children. Since that last meeting six months later his friend was clearly looking better, smiling again, happy, except that he did not purr like a real cat. The flimsy hut of his parents had turned into a two-story solid cottage. When did he manage to do that? The house, I should say, was on the very edge of town. Beyond our street was only a steep descent down to the river and the fields. No one built anything there. The soil was bad. We used to play down there as kids. The place was deserted and creepy. People often drowned on that stretch of river. The adults used to say it was because of an underground spring with icy water a man got into the stream of water from an underground spring and his legs convulsed. And in winter all was clear thin ice. Everyone knew the place was bad for swimming but the river took five to six people a year. There were silly stories among the children about, about evil ghosts dragging people down to the bottom. The reason for the stories was could the black remains of the burnt out village remained on that bank. The village's evil ghosts and the devils. Stone were almost sights in our backwoods. It was to the latter that our feet brought us on our first nature outing. We just walked around and chatted. The dam rock was a huge boulder on the river bank with incomprehensible signs carved on it. There were a lot of stories around it, mostly about all sorts of pagan rituals, and they were probably not far from the truth. We found small animals and birds' feathers on it several times. I do not know whether it was a sacrifice or maybe someone just wanted to scare children away from a dangerous place. No one believed it, of course. I remember from my childhood how Lenka, my classmate, buried her favorite doll nearby, crying and asking her parents to stop drinking. They didn't, of course. Strange thing, by the way, I thought that with time, under its monstrous weight, the stone would sink into the sand by at least a quarter. Sitting on a high cliff, I complained to Cat about how badly things were going. I asked him to come back again, and he looked at the water in silence. And then a bad idea popped into my head. I stood up and, placing both hands on a boulder, loudly asked the universe for money to solve problems. A lot of it quickly, and so that I would get nothing for it. The cat was amused he said that he would think about it, since I had already decided to ask the devil for money. Already in the evening, sitting over some homemade plum wine, he offered to help me with his savings. But my business wasn't so bad that I would get my friends' accounts, especially since there were no jobs in this hole he must have expected to live on them, and I had some hope that he would return to the capital. And suddenly my pride kicked in. Can't I do anything without him? Looking for a new topic of conversation, I looked around the kitchen, noting that it lacked a woman's hand. 
Everything was neat and clean, Cot was very picky in this regard, but it lacked something soulful and cozy, like embroidery or something like that. And all sorts of feminine things were missing from the bathroom. I cautiously inquired, how long has it been with Spetka? No, I did not. She drowned at the beginning of May. The cat opened the window and returned to the table, smoking. It was a rare sight, for in my memory he had never smoked indoors. We used to live here. We had a fight in the evening. She ran out into the street, hysterical. I followed her, came to my senses, decided to make up, but there was such a fog that no matter how much I walked, I kept coming back to the house. In the morning downstream, he paused and reached into the drawer for another bottle. We found her. Stupid to soothe my nerves at night by swimming in cold water. I do see her though, sometimes. It was like a cold wave. He said it in his normal mundane voice, like he was asking me what time it was. I got over myself, smirked, and moved the bottle away from him. The cat appreciated the joke, laughed and, having lit another cigarette, moved to the porch. The fog was thickening. It was a frequent visitor here in the lowlands. That's where I see Svetka. It seems to be standing there, calling, and then goes down to the river. Believe it or not, I wanted to go away a hundred times, at least to the city center, but I still wait in the evenings for that stupid fog. If only I had found her then. There, you see? He waved his hand frantically in the direction of the river, but I could see nothing. It was all a blur, and then Pote rushed out of his seat and was about to go there, not himself, and I I could hardly catch him and drag him almost by force into the house. Under the bright light of the kitchen chandelier, he seemed to come to his senses, apologized, and went to bed. A week and a half flew by almost imperceptibly. A comfortable house, nature, fresh air, healthy meals, and Coda was a great entertainer. In general, I did not want to go back to Moscow, but I had to. He would have been better off not to go back, but to get lost somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Everything went wrong, everything fell apart, no matter what I undertook, and my youngest daughter became seriously ill. Within a month, my whole life had collapsed into debt. Creditors began to threaten. My wife was afraid to leave the house. He decided to sell the apartment, and the control shot the news of the death of the cat. I sat by the phone with a dull expression, listening to something about inheritance. Well, I could not even imagine that this will ever happen. He was more family to me than all the relatives put together. I don't remember driving there, straight to the cemetery. He was even buried by his in-laws. I found out too late. Talked to him about something. And God, even standing at his grave, I desperately didn't want to believe it. It was all a blur. It turned out that he had left me a house in a two-room apartment downtown. I didn't even know about the latter. I guess he really wanted to get away from his foggy visions. I went to his house. It was getting dark, so I went straight to bed. At night I woke up to a strange noise downstairs, thinking that thieves had gotten into the officially empty house. What to take here? I was rather surprised that no one had broken in so far. I grabbed the steel rod that was used to straighten the curtains and went to the first floor. But no, there was no one there. I imagined it, or maybe I was dreaming. I relaxed and put my foot on the stairs of the second floor when I heard a ringing sound 
someone in the kitchen. I rushed over there. I turned on the light and was dumbfounded. There was cats sitting at the table. Not a zombie, not a corpse, but my friend, real and as alive. Only a little pale. He smiled, made a gesture inviting me to sit down. I didn't sit down. I just collapsed on the chair, clutching the steel rod like the last straw that kept me from either fainting or going insane. The cat, alive, could it be a mix-up? Someone buried the wrong person? Or is there a ghost in my kitchen? I thought about it, and then I stopped myself. It's me in his kitchen, not the other way around. And it's as if he heard my thoughts and smiled more than ever. And he says quietly, Well, is the house and the apartment enough for the debts? Or did you have to write off the car? His voice is intonation, but so empty. He smiles with his lips and eyes, but his voice is empty and colorless. He poured me a glass of his homemade wine, smiling, and I thought I was going crazy. I drank the glass in a gulp and clung to my bar again. And the cat reached for the newspaper, tore off a scrap and wrote something, and put it in front of me. I read Ron End. I woke up in a cold sweat. A big shiver hit me. It's three in the morning. The usual fog outside the window. Only sleep. After calming myself down, I went into the kitchen for a drink of water. I stumbled as I entered there it was, my saving steel rod. I turned on the light and saw an empty bottle and a glass on the table, upside down. There's something under the glass, right? A piece of newspaper with run on it. I woke up at 6 in the morning, in my car, clutching a metal icon of Nicholas the Wonder Worker, previously glued to the front panel. I was dreaming, dreaming, sleepwalking. I talked myself out of it, went to the house, or was it not a dream? There stands in the fog, waving, calling. A cat? I don't know what I was thinking then, or if I was thinking at all, but I followed him. I walked, walked, walked. It seemed to me that the devil had been leading me around in circles, laughing in his friend's voice, calling me. It was as if I knew it wasn't the cat, but I was so desperate to tear myself away. As if, if I caught the ghost, I would be able to bring my friend back. I believed it. I believed it or something. And I'd never believed in anything more than that outright mystical nonsense at the time. It was very cold, but I didn't feel it until someone sharply yanked me back. It turned out that I was already standing almost waist deep in the icy water next to the devil's rock, and some old man was pulling me by the hand. It was a lucky coincidence that a neighbor saw me running toward the river and followed me. I told him everything. I thought he was going to call an ambulance, but he just shook his head. He said a lot of fools go to the rock, and then they catch them, or their loved ones the most expensive, he said takes away. He said the cat was knowledgeable, not our type. I looked at him dumbfounded. How could I listen when he was dead? My grandfather only shook his hands. He said it was a pity his woman was a fool, just like you. I warmed up and went to the cemetery. I don't know what I was expecting to see there. An open grave? A ghost again? From the monument looks cat, next to the tomb of his wife. A colorless mouse, which no one would have never paid attention to, if not for her cherished desire, begged in the right place. Except that the devils on a tray cannot bring love, no matter how much you wish, but quickly take there. Yesterday I would have never believed such nonsense, but now it was almost the only 
and the most logical explanation of his departure. I sold the inheritance later, of course. It saved my skin, but I still often dream that I'm looking for my friend in the fog, that he's right there, stretching out his hand, but he keeps slipping away, and I dream of that laugh. And that, enough for debts? I'm afraid to go into the kitchen at night. He's there sometimes, smiling, advising, always right. But how I'm afraid of him, and I'm afraid of myself. How hard it is to live with this guilt that presses on my chest with all the weight of a bloody stone. How scary it is to fall asleep when these horrible nightmares are waiting for me. When the bloody fog beckons, 